this morning we're going to spend our time in Psalm 146. So if you have your Bibles or if you have your Bible app, uh, feel free to go ahead and whip that out. And I'm going to read that. So if you want to join me in that, I'd welcome you. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There's no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and all their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He made the heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He keeps every promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and widows, and he frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God. O oh, Jerusalem, throughout the generations, praise the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of the word this morning. So I want you to close your eyes just for a second. Go ahead, close them. And I want you to think back to the games that you played, maybe as a child, maybe it was at a birthday party or a social gathering, perhaps at youth group, because they make you play all kinds of crazy games. Now I want you to narrow in on that one game that you dreaded playing. You know that one game that makes your body recoil, and maybe it starts making you sweat a little, and your heart starts racing? Now open your eyes. Musical chairs. How many of you would say that musical chairs was that one game you dreaded playing? All two of you and myself. All right, so growing up, I hated playing musical chairs. I hated when someone announced that they were going to have us play musical chairs. In fact, they didn't even need to announce that we were gonna play musical chairs. Just by the mere setup of chairs, I knew what would be happening. My body would start cringing and for those of you who are unfamiliar with this game of musical chairs, it would start off with this whole setup of chairs, sometimes in a row, sometimes in a circle, and everybody in the room would gather around those chairs, and usually there was one chair that was missing, one less than the number of people playing. And somebody would cue the music, right? And then everyone would start walking around those chairs, maybe kind of like this. And then as soon as the music stopped, you would have to secure your behind on one of the chairs as fast as you can. Now, I don't know about you, but the people that I played with took this as a high contact sport. So people would be elbowing each other, body checking, sometimes you'd get someone's shoulder in your face. Um, usually it was someone else's shoulder in my face. And it was not a casual game. It was not a safe game for me. So it wasn't unusual for someone my size to get bumped off my seat right when I was about to sit down. You see, musical chairs, as an adult, I realized that it rewarded the strong, the powerful, the quick, and I hated musical chairs. So if you think about it, American culture and society has socialized us to take up space. So growing up, games like musical chairs, or maybe any of you that played Monopoly, the board game, it started conditioning us to believe that in order to win, you needed to defeat your opponent, right? And the only way to do that is to grab the last chair or buy the most expensive homes or the most homes on the board game and so acquiring the most property and bankrupting your fellow players, that was the way to win. Now this doesn't just end 
with childhood games, right? We continue seeing this acquiring of space or defending of space throughout our lives. Oh, there's a picture up there. Um, so there's a picture of my two nephews. There they are. Uh, they're uh, two of my most favorite little human beings, Liam and Lucas. For the longest time, they would beg my husband James and I to let them sleep over at our place. And we love them. They're eight and 11. And uh, you know, James and I, we live in a one bedroom, 606 square feet condo. So it's a little cozy, but eventually, a couple months ago, we thought, you know what, they're only gonna get bigger. So let's go ahead and have them sleep over. So we, uh, uh, you know, hung out with them for the day and, you know, caught some Pokemon, played some basketball, played some chess. And at night, we were tucking them in. We laid two sleeping bags out on a rug in our living room. We zipped them up because, you know, sleeping bags only give you this much space. So we knew that they would be confined. And, uh, you know, we closed the door, went into our bedroom. We thought they were asleep. But 30 minutes into it, I hear them talking. And then it gets a little louder and then a little louder. And then I'm listening by the door because I don't want to go out there. And I hear them arguing. And what are they arguing about? The other person hogging up space. Now, I didn't think that was possible since we zipped them up. But hogging up space. This concept of space, it follows us, uh, us into adulthood. So on a daily basis, finding and securing space might look like trying to get a parking spot on campus, right? Uh, maybe trying to get a table in the calf during lunchtime. Maybe it was a few weeks ago trying to get a spot into that overcrowded class. I'm sure none of you experienced that. Or trying to get into a dorm. Or lately, how about this, trying to get tickets to Chance the Rapper concert coming up. Anybody? All right, five of you. And what happens when we secure a spot, or better yet, we secure the best spot? We feel pretty awesome about ourselves, don't we? We might even feel like we've earned it. That space is ours. And for a moment, we feel invincible. Or at least that's how I feel when I've had a very long commute on three freeways to get here, over an hour, and I still manage to secure that very last spot in parking lot B, and in that moment, in my car, before I get out, I might be doing a little victory dance, you know? Cabbage patch a little, Robocop a little bit. Um, and then I get out of my car. And I might see another car coming into the lot after me, and my first thought is not, oh no, I've taken the last spot. And now this car can't get it. No, no, I don't think that. To be honest, I don't think about pulling out of my spot. I don't think about offering up that spot to somebody else. You see, our country's history has had very dark moments. It's had dark moments of keeping groups of people out through exclusion acts, through internment camps. Issues of who belongs in this space are not new to us. So today on a global, national, and local scale, the refugee crisis, immigration, homelessness, these are all issues of space. Who has space? Who does not have space? Who deserves space? And who has a right to space? And who does not have a right to space? So just in the county of Los Angeles, the homeless population grew uh, almost 6% between 2015 and 2018. There's a homeless count that happens every January. And so there are about 47,000 homeless people in LA County, and seven, about 75% of them live unsheltered. And that means they live in their cars, or they live in tents like this, or they live in encampments. And at the same time, home prices rose 7.5% in LA County between 2015 and 2016. And you might think, well, why does that matter? I'm a college student. Um, making home buying that much harder and acquiring a little piece of space in Los Angeles has become even more difficult. 
You see, we've pitted this conversation, this idea, this concept of space as a zero-sum game. And that means in order for one person or a group of people to win or gain, another person or another group of people have to lose. But I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that the kingdom of God is oriented around the same rules of the game. So the psalmist this morning leads us on this really interesting journey in this chapter. So I want you to envision with me this chapter laid out as instructions for the game of life. So the writer opens up with this invitation of praise. Holler at your friends, come play, right? So the psalmist gathers our friends around to play in this game of life through worship first. And then the psalmist leads us into verses three and four, where instructions and warnings are first given, like in Monopoly, where it tells you you don't want to land on the square that says, go to jail, or the square that says, pay your income tax. And here the psalmist writes, do not put your trust in powerful people, and powerful people in the day were the political leaders, because there is no help for you there. We're then reminded as we move on to verse six, who the creator of this game is. It's not Milton Bradley, the creator of Operation or Twister, if you played that. But the creator is the God of heaven and earth and the sea. You see, friends, these are images that remind us of vast, open, and endless space. This is a God, this is a creator who is abundant and generous. And then as we move on to this last part of the psalm, the writer offers something fascinating. Perhaps even how to partner with the creator toward the goal of this game, hashtag winning. We're reminded starting in verse seven that the God, the creator, gives justice to the oppressed. And just in case we didn't know who the oppressed were, the psalmist lays out in the eyes of God and society at the time who the oppressed were. The immigrant or the sojourner, the prisoner, the orphan, the widow, the refugee or the foreigner. For whom have been historically excluded and marginalized? So you see these groups, they typically don't get space, right? And they're probably never going to win in musical chairs. They're not traditionally seen by society as the fastest, the strongest, the most powerful, hold the most privilege, or have the loudest voices. And yet, and yet, the psalmist makes great effort to remind us of how the Lord lifts up and sustains, holds, watches over, and faithfully dignifies these groups by acknowledging and opening up space for them. Friends, we are being beckoned by God to join in creating space for the marginalized and perhaps even giving up space for them. But you see, it requires this reorientation of our hearts with a willingness to push back on the ways we've been conditioned to believe in our own entitlement and a belief in what is ours or belongs to us. But let's be honest, real talk here. Giving up space is not easy, particularly if you believe you've had every right to occupy that space. I get it. I totally get it. So just as uh, Todd had mentioned, Last month, I was traveling with my husband, James, and my parents um, to Dubai and South Africa. We were part of this big tour, and we spent the first three days in Dubai, and on that third night, we were headed to Cape Town, South Africa, and it so happened to be my birthday that day, like one of your big birthdays, one of those? Okay. So it was one of those days, and so the four of us and this tour of 42 other people who soon became my best friends headed to the Dubai airport at 9 p.m. to catch a 4 a.m. flight. So keep in mind, if you do the math, 
That's seven hours prior to check-in. So if you've traveled before, you know you pull up your luggage, you go up to the counter, the counter that says check-in, you drop off your luggage, and that's what we did. And so as we got up there, the airline staff says, oh, the flight is full. You can take another flight tomorrow morning, about in about 12 hours. So I'm completely confused because it says check-in, and I'm checking in. How is it that we're checking in seven hours prior to takeoff with our tickets paid in full and told that our flight is overbooked and there's no space for us, there's no seats left for us, and this happened to 14 others on our tour. So we get shuffled over to this other counter. I notice that this is apparently the waiting section for anyone that didn't get a seat with their paid ticket and they're waiting for a change of events, maybe somebody else that doesn't show up or someone that cancels their, their flight. And by now, it's 10 p.m. And so we're speaking to this other airline staff at the counter, and I'm explaining that we're part of this tour group. We really need to get on. My parents are on. I can't leave them. They're kind of old. And then he asks, well, did you check in 48 hours before the flight? So I'm, I'm completely confused. I look at him and ask him, is it required for me to check in two days before my flight in order to have a seat on the plane? And I remind him, I, my ticket is paid for in full. So he looks at me and he says, well, if you want a seat on the, uh, a seat on the plane, and then he goes on to tell me that airlines typically overbook their flights by 10 to 11% and they're expecting cancellations, and that way airlines don't lose any money on any of their seats, and if you didn't know, now you know. And sure, I get why they do that. It's kind of a game, right? And They don't want to lose money. But sometimes, there are no cancellations, and you end up in a situation that we just found ourselves in. And just like when I was seven years old and somebody said that we're gonna play musical chairs, I sense my muscles begin to tighten, and then my body is sweating a little more, and my heart begins to race, and I think about how unjust this is. I begin talking a bit louder, and I demand a seat for us on that plane. And I even threw in that it was my birthday to drum up some sympathy, and that didn't work. And all the while, my husband is next to me. He stays really calm because in every situation, there's a good cop and a bad cop, and somehow I'm always the bad cop. And then the man tells us, well, you know, your best option is to wait till about 3 a.m., one hour before the flight, to see if anyone doesn't show up. So being the obedient Asian daughter that I was growing up, I decided to take on a new persona. I wasn't going to take that for an answer especially since him and I have been going at it for over an hour now at the counter. I whipped out my phone and I've gone off on this tweet storm with the airline because I heard sometimes that works. It didn't. I may or may not have used some choice words. And then I threatened to never fly this airline ever again. And then I noticed that this man is completely unsympathetic to me. So I asked to speak with his manager. So this woman walks over and tells us the exact same thing. So after a long and heated exchange, she eventually tells the man to open up 10 seats. Yeah, 10 seats. I was puzzled too. 10 seats. You had 10 seats? This whole time, now that's what I said with my inside voice, I didn't say that out loud, because I wasn't going to ask how those 10 seats magically appeared. All I know was we were getting ourselves on that flight that night, right? We had seats. And guess who made that happen? Yeah, me. <laughs> After all, I had just spent two hours, more than two hours at the counter, and it was almost midnight. So he asks for our passports, and I whip it out and throw it like a Frisbee at him um, as quick as I can because I wanted to secure a boarding pass. I didn't care who had the other eight seats. All I knew was we were getting our seats and we were checking in. My parents were already inside. And then out of the corner of my eye, I notice someone walking over, and I try not to make eye contact. 
And then I noticed that someone from our tour group, and she probably noticed and smelled my excitement from a distance, and she asked if we got seats, and I kind of mumble yes, but there's eight other seats for whomever, whomever wants them. And then she has the audacity to ask us if we would give up our two seats for the elderly in our group. So I, you know, I looked at my husband because there was no way on the side of heaven we were giving up those seats. I was the one who got us those seats and you're welcome, the other eight other seats. And I was the one that was standing at the counter for all this time in a really, really friendly, Christ-loving exchange with the airline staff. And so at least two of those seats were ours. I earned them. I fought for them. They're ours. So I look over at my husband, James. I try to maintain eye contact with him, like stay with me. We're on the same page here. And then his eyes shift and look over at the group of elderly that were probably way past their bedtime. And they've been waiting as long as we have but I couldn't bear to give up our seats after what we had just been through. And then it happened. He said it. And I may or may not have responded like this. <laughs> so we gave up our seats and oh, the range of thoughts and emotions that overtook me, feelings of injustice, Feelings of anger and loss and resentment, feeling robbed and then defeated. What was happening? And in that moment, I remembered something my wise preacher sister Ellen said. Sometimes the things that offend your mind reveal the deep things in your heart. So, 12.30 a.m., I shuffled myself and my luggage from counter four in the Dubai airport to the seats in the waiting zone with a voucher in hand from the airline for a free snack and drink. And I sat there and there's my tennis shoes because I wanted to capture that moment. And so you'll have to ask me after chapel if I ever got on a flight that, that very night, but let's be real, it's hard to give up space, especially when you feel like you've earned it. Our society is oriented around rewarding those that have made it, right? We reward them with bigger offices, bigger homes, bigger cars, bigger seats, more leg room on the plane, bigger platforms so their voices can be heard even louder. More space translates to more privilege, and more privilege makes one feel more powerful, and maybe even begin to believe that you got there all by yourself. And honestly, truly, how many of us would voluntarily give all that up? Yet, yeah, God calls us to rethink the rules of the game in our society and calls us to play by a different set of rules. He calls us to make space for those who are not the strongest, not the most powerful, not the most visible, nor the most privileged in our society today. And we see Jesus in the Gospels making space for those on society's margins. We see this in Luke with a sinful woman entering the home of a Pharisee to anoint Jesus' feet with perfume, washing his feet with her tears and her hair. And what happens? Meanwhile, the Pharisees standing by bulk at the woman who entered the home of this Pharisee completely uninvited. And they balk at Jesus who allowed her to take up space at this dinner. And what does Jesus do? Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and creates space for this woman and goes on to affirm her for coming into this home and we see this again in John 4, right? So for those of you that remember, Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well. And here Jesus crosses all social and cultural boundaries to extend space for this woman to tell her story. And maybe some of you remember this woman given space to share her narrative and experience the love of Christ. She goes back to her village 
empowered and becomes instrumental in the salvation of many Samaritans, she was welcomed by Jesus to share space that afternoon and given an opportunity for her voice to be heard. So maybe some of you are being challenged to share space or even give up space in your community this morning. You've had the privilege of maybe having space being the majority and having had your voices heard. Maybe it's time, maybe it's time to rethink who has been excluded. And let me challenge your mind and heart to this. When you think about it, Who comes to mind? Who are the groups that have not earned the right to be here, whose voices and narratives have been historically overlooked and undervalued? Start there. And if you're not sure, here are some suggestions of who have been historically marginalized in our society. Begin by listening. And if you think there isn't enough space, consider giving up your space, whether physical space or space for different voices to be heard. And perhaps some of you can identify with these groups. Maybe you are some of these groups and have felt marginalized or crowded out because of your race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, immigration status, social class, or physical capabilities. I want to encourage you It might feel scary at first, but your presence matters. And there is room for you. Find your voice, use your voice. In fact, we need your voices, your narratives and your perspectives, your stories of lament and your stories of resilience and victory. They're prophetic messages to us. And you see, friends, this is not about politics. This is about the prophetic call for Christ's followers to live out kingdom principles. You see, the gospel calls us to justice, and the word justice should not be co-opted to mean just us. You see, winning in the kingdom of God is not about who grabs that last seat at the end of musical chairs, otherwise the majority of us would be losers. It's not about keeping people out. It's not about banning people so that only a few can secure their space and be winners. It is the opposite. The gospel is counter-narrative to what our society deems as the rules of the game. And the psalmist this morning reminds us of that, right? We are called to take stock of who is not present when you look around, whose voices are not heard, and we are called to extend space for others. So before you leave this morning, I wanna bless you. So if you can all stand, if you are able, and if you feel comfortable, if you can just extend your hands out to receive the blessing, And I want to bless you this morning. May each of you be instruments of God's peace and fierce and fearless advocates of justice. And may you, being rooted so ever deeply in God's love, courageously step out as a community that expands space and creates room for those in our community and in our society's margins. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.